Okay, so hello and welcome back to another Unity multiplayer tutorial. There's been quite a lot of people asking to see how the spell system works in the game that I'm developing, so we'll be going through the code there from where the input is taken, through the spell logic, all the way to when the spell is actually cast. I hope you're looking forward to it, so let's get started. So a quick reminder for those of you who haven't been keeping up with the devlog series, I can host a game, join on a client, and select from one of four different schools of magic at the moment. So I'm going to go with Geomancy over here, and then Aeromancy over here. So we've got the Rock and the Earth attack, and then we'll ready up, start the game. And you can see we have the two players here, and I still have the uh, charges text in the wrong place, but you see the 4 out of 4 and 8 out of 8. So if I hold down left click on the right here, I can shoot out these 8 pellets before it stops, recharges, goes back up to 8, and I can shoot again. And they do relatively low damage, I can shoot these target dummies and you can see their health bars going down and then when they reach zero they fill back up just so I can keep testing on them. And if we go to the other one, I have four charges but these are bigger hitting and this spell has a channel duration so it fills up a channel bar and then when it's finished it will launch this projectile and this projectile has gravity and it arcs whereas the other one doesn't. So we have these two spells quite similar but working in different ways. So that's all stuff I've shown in the previous devlog, so let's have a look at the code now. So of course this all starts off with input. So I'm using the new Unity input system, at this point it's not really new anymore. And if we look at my controls, you'll see here I've got a menu action map. The only input you can do on the menu is close it. Then I have the player action map, everything you can do when you're just playing the game. So for now, move, jump, look, primary fire, which is just left click, then all the action bars interact for interacting with objects in the world, and then opening the menu or opening the developer console. And then there's the developer console map, which then has the input to close it. And I can change through these different action maps based on whether I'm in the menu or not, or in the developer console or not. Then from this action map, over here, we generate a C-sharp class called controls. So if I go into my scripts, input controls, I'll open that up in VS Code. So this script is the auto-generated script from our action map, and it has everything set up for us. We never need to touch this, but I have my own class, kind of like a wrapper on this, called the input reader, and I got this idea from Unity themselves. They use this in their uh, open project game, and what we do is we implement an interface for each of the different action maps. So we've got I menu actions, player actions, developer console actions, and then we create these methods for each of them, and I've put them in regions just so we can fold them all up if we want. So in menu we've got the on close menu and we've got all the player ones and then the on close console. And what we do in each of these is we check the context to see if the button was pressed, released or whatever we want to check about it. So for closing the menu we check performed. So we check was the close menu button pressed and if it was then we raise our own C sharp event. So we are in the middle of the input system and our own game so we can raise uh, events however we want and we can pass in our own data if we want so jumping just happens so it's an action but looking and moving has input for the vector 2 is it up down left or right and then primary fire uh, toggling it on and off if you hold left click it goes to true and when you release left click it sends false through here so this is all how I handle input. I do want to mention that all the code here is from a game early in development. So that doesn't mean that everything I'm showing you is perfect and I'll probably iterate on things over time. So for example, primary fire is how I do my left click. So if we go over to the spellcaster, let's go look over here. So when the spellcaster spawns, if we're on the server, we do this. And if we're on the client, we do this. And obviously the clients handle their input. So we're checking here, input reader, primary fire event. So when the person presses the left click button, we call handle primary fire and that checks if we're targeting. Now I haven't currently got a spell that uses targeting so we can kind of ignore this for now. Um, it just sets a ball to true and the reason why we are doing this is because I allow the player to hold left click to keep attacking. So rather than having to spam left click to fire eight bullets on the air spell, you can just hold left click and every time it's ready it will keep firing a new one. So we turn that on and off. Another thing that I mentioned in the previous video to keep in mind is that I have some logic on the client side that 
ideally should be on the server side, but because we don't have client side prediction and lag compensation yet, I decided just to put some of it on the client side, but I do know in the future I will move it. But for example, if I go up to where is firing is used, the owner is checking if we're firing and handling, checking if we can basic tack and if it's on cooldown or not. So this means the clients are in charge of handling cooldowns and spell charges, mana, that kind of thing. So you don't want that ideally because then clients can cheat. If people know how to hack their client, they can you know, effectively just fire off as fast as they want regardless of any cooldowns or anything. So keep that in mind. I will change this in the future, but it works simply enough for now. So the first thing the owner does is checks, do we have a basic attack charge? That's the thing that the air spell had eight of. Every time you cast, it removes one. So when you're at zero, obviously you can't attack. And then it stores how long until it recharges. And then if we go down here, once it's run out of time until recharging, it can then set it back up to the max charges and you can start firing again. So this script purely handles charges. And then a similar thing here with the cooldown, we check a script on the player to see if the spell is on cooldown. So we store here a list of spell cooldown state, the spells are on cooldown. This is just the ID of the spell and when it's ready. And then in the update, we keep checking, has the time passed for the spell to be ready? And if it is, remove it from this list. So to check if a spell's on cooldown, you just check, is it in this list? And then if it is, we return true, and if it's not, we return false. And then we also want to make sure we don't cast this spell if we're in the middle of casting another spell. So for the earth spell where we have the channel bar that fills up, we don't want to be able to cast another spell while that is channeling because it's busy doing that. And then once our checks have been done, we can trigger this event. And this is to do with visual scripting. So custom event is a visual scripting thing. You can trigger one, you pass in the object to do it on. So we're doing it on our basic attack spell behavior game object. And that is, if we go back to Unity so you can see what this is, let's go over to, let's say the wind slash attack. We have this game object here and it's pretty, pretty empty. It's just a game object with a spell behavior script on it and a script machine, which is the visual scripting you've probably seen before. So once the player spawns in after selecting Aeromancy, we instantiate this game object and we child it to the player and we get reference to it. So if we look back in our script and we go up to the start method, you'll see over here, we instantiate the school they selected basic attack spell behavior. And that's the thing I just showed you. And then we initialize it. We just pass in reference to this spell caster and that's used in the spells later. And then we add it to our list of spell behaviors and we also store it as our basic attack spell. And that's how we then reference it down here. So we trigger on this object, an event called casting started event name. That's just a const I made, just called casting started. So the reason I do it this way is these lines that we have before the custom event are just things that are checked for every single basic attack spell because they all have charges, cooldowns, and can't be cast while casting other things. So we do all this in code and then we trigger a custom event and that takes us into the visual scripting, which I've chosen because I want the spells to be designed in a visual way. I think it works better for the spells. I think it's easier to kind of adjust things and iterate over time and experiment with things. And I think it's more fun and it's laid out in a way that makes designing a spell easier. So for some reason, uh, parts of the UI are a bit weird. That just keeps happening with visual scripting for some reason, but you can at least see the different connections here. So on our graph, I have all the data down here for the spell, all the kind of settings. So we have the spell scriptable object, the animation to play, the projectile prefab spawn, uh, the aiming tilt and the force, all, all the kind of custom variables for spawning in this spell and handling it. And that custom event we trigger called casting started goes into here. So this is a subgraph, which is just another graph that we can reuse. And this graph, all it does is it uses the custom event node and this takes in a string. So the event name and just outputs um, a trigger here whenever that event is called. So we have the string here, this const we had in a code. We have the casting started event I made it a public const so it shows up in visual scripting. I plug that in as the string 
And then whenever we trigger that event, it goes to the output, which in our case goes here, puts it on cooldown. Putting it on cooldown is just another subgraph, gets our spell caster, grabs the cooldown handler, and puts the spell on cooldown, then continues. So these kind of um, repetitive logic things that uh, we have all over the place, I've put into subgraphs so I can keep reusing them. Then we consume a base attack charge, play an animation for all the clients, and then we launch the projectile. So at the moment, this code in the green box is handled on the owner, and then the red box is handled on the server. So the owner's going to spawn in a kind of dummy version of the spell. So if it's a projectile like a fireball, it will spawn in just the visuals of the fireball. And then it will tell the server, hey, spawn in the actual fireball. The server will do that. And then it will relay that message to all the other clients and they'll spawn in the dummy one too. That's what this spawnable index is, this dummy spawnable index. On our spell, if I go over to the spell, we have a list of spawnables and this is just things we can spawn in with the spell. So at the moment I have the dummy projectile, which if you look over here, for this spell is just a sphere and not much else. Um, it does have a lifetime and when it collides it gets destroyed, but it doesn't deal any damage, just destroys itself. So when we call that launch projectile owner and server where we're handling the spawning in of projectiles and stuff like that, we have to deal with RPCs and sending stuff back and forth from the server. So we do that in a C sharp script. So if I go over to the code, we have the spell, where is it? Mechanics handler, here we go. And this handles the animation and also the projectiles. I won't go through every line here since this is to do with spawning stuff in and raycasts or whatever, so it's, it's nothing important. But this is what we call the method where we pass in the spell, the spawnable index, the tilt, and the force. And the owner is going to effectively check where it should spawn in, do all that, and it then calls a server RPC telling the server what spell we're casting, uh, where it should spawn in, and the rotation. And then the after telling the server to do that, it will then spawn in its own dummy version and launch that off. That's purely just for visuals, so you get that instant feedback. And then the server will receive that message. And the server calls a custom event. And that custom event the server calls is, if we go back over, this red bit down here. I know sometimes visual scripting is weird. This is perfectly fine. It's still working. It just shows up as red for some reason. But it comes in here, the launch projectile event. And the server will then call launch projectile server. And you might wonder, you know, why don't I just do this entirely in the code? But it's because different spells will want to do different things. At the moment, this is very basic and we just want to spawn it in, but other spells will do other things. So that's why we've got this here just for the future. And it calls this method, which will spawn in the projectile and then tell all of the clients to spawn in the dummy zero which is just the dummy projectile prefab. And then the clients will receive this RPC and then they'll spawn in the dummy prefab and launch it off. So yeah, that's pretty much it. I know there was a lot to take in there and me going through all this code I've written over time in a matter of 10, 15, 20 minutes. Now, obviously it'll be hard to take it all in fully, but uh, obviously with this video, you could slow it down, go back, rewatch parts if you want and see, see bits of the code. Cause I'm not going to put this publicly on GitHub, at least I don't plan to, because it is my own project that I plan on one day releasing. So I want to keep, you know, the entire code base private apart from bits I decide to show on stream or on YouTube. So the other thing in here, I guess, is the animation. So it's the same thing. The server, sorry, the owner does this. The owner tells server, the server then tells all the clients. The reason why the server doesn't actually do anything in here is because the server doesn't need to play an animation. It won't do anything. Whereas with projectiles, the server needs a version of the projectile that handles dealing damage and exploding or whatever. But animations are purely visual, so we just have the client see them. The entire point in the script is for any logic that needs to RPC back and forth from the server. So this is where that's all handled. At the moment, that's just animation and projectiles. There might be more, I'm sure there will be more further down the line that this script will handle. So I'm pretty sure that's the flow for spellcasting. The only other thing that might be worth looking at is the actual projectile itself. So we have the base, which is never actually spawned in. It's just a prefab that we make variants of. 
So we have the dummy version, which is just visual, and all it does is it destroys itself on collision. And then we have the one that's not a dummy, that's the server one. I could put underscore server, it might make sense. And that also has the same lifetime, uh, detects the same uh, collision layers, all that stuff. And then, yeah, again, it looks like it's broken, but that's just because I need to regenerate the, the nodes. It takes in the event, it then deals damage to the thing we collided with, and then it destroys itself, and that's it. And deal damage is take the thing we collided with, get the damageable component, and if it has it, then deal damage to it. And I might as well just quickly show you the damageable component. So that'll be in combat, projectiles, oh sorry, no wait, getting lost in here, just combat. Just has a deal damage method that then modifies the health. I've put damageable separate from the health script because I can stick health on everything that's health and then damageable on things that can be damaged and then I can make healable and maybe certain objects can be damaged but not healed so I just don't put on the heal uh, the healable script. It's just like a very component based way of doing this kind of stuff rather than on the health script having bulls for can be damaged, can be healed, can be this, can be that. I'd rather just attach and remove components to build up the entire logic. So yeah, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, then please leave a like and subscribe. Let me know down below what you want to see next. I'm sure there's other things in the game that people want to see tutorials on, so if you have questions about this one, then let me know down below. Of course, if you want any more insight into how things work here. But I hope you enjoyed. I hope you found this useful. That's it for now, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye. But of course, before I go, I've got to thank my patrons. A special thanks to Alan W, Francisco Lira, Sahila, John Jannigan Mills, Benjamin Hilda, David McDermott, Evan Maxey, George Ru Pierce, Katinka Mom, Lawrence Simpson, Malvin, Mark McCorkle, Mike Miller, Rack, Andrew Williams, Theory, and Dario. If anyone else is able to help support the channel monetarily, the link to Patreon is down below. If not, there are also links down below to other social media, such as Twitch, Twitter, and Discord. If you could help us out by following on any of those or checking any of those out, that'd be greatly appreciated. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.